Hey everyone, welcome back to Alchemy with Zero Phase. I'm Eric, and I wanted to do a video retouching on some of the things that I do with Automatic 11.11, how I have it set up, particular settings. I have had some people ask me uh, to kind of go over it again, because things change. You know, they've come up with updates, and uh, especially with SDXL out, and making adjustments for that and uh, so let's dive into this uh, I'm gonna kind of start from like how I load automatic 1111 um, with the web UI, uh, the uh, sorry the uh, web UI user bat file so in this file uh, you, most of you should be fairly familiar with this the one line that most of you are uh, very well aware of is the command line arguments in mine, I use the dash dash listen. And this is specifically for uh, allowing me access externally. I do have my firewall set up uh, so that uh, I have external access from my, uh, from my phone or other devices if I want to mess with it, which I do a lot. I use, my, I use this on my phone primarily. I almost never use it for my desktop. So, um, what this does is it sets automatic 1111 in a mode that uh, allows it to take requests from the local area network. Okay, um, And then from there you can actually set up your firewall, whether it's doing port forwarding or setting up firewall rules to allow traffic through based on certain criteria. So and that's how I have mine set up. I love it. Uh, I love being able to just, if I'm taking a lunch or whatever, jump on my phone, if I got an idea, I can throw that in. So the next one is the enable and secure extension access. Some of you probably have never heard of this. Um, because I use the dash dash listen all the time, if I want to install an extension, if I wasn't using this right here, uh, it it puts automatic 11.11 in a mode that when you're using listen, it won't allow you to install extensions. It's kind of a uh, security thing. But by enabling this right here, you can have the listen mode enabled, so you can still access externally. But you can also you can also uh, install extensions and work with your extensions because of this. If you don't have this, it'll come back and tell you that you uh, you can't install extensions it'll do, you know, because it's in uh, a secure mode. The no half VAE, opt, SDP attention, and Xformers, med VRAM are all just part of uh, managing memory and uh, helping uh, speed things up a little bit. So you can play with these. There is a, um, uh, a website, I'll, I'll see if I can link to it, that goes through all of the different command line arguments that you can use for automatic 11.11. Um, and they have pretty good ex explanations of what each one does. This is just how I have mine set up and obviously the uh, port 7860, which is the standard port. Next thing on here is the git pull. You throw this in here on this command line and it will automatically update automatic 11.11 every time you load it up. Okay. Pretty simple stuff. Uh, nothing fantastic, no nothing extraordinary there. So in my interface, um, I don't have a lot of extensions going right now. Um, I'm going to go through the ones that I do, what they what they're for, uh, why I use them, and uh, how it benefits uh, what I do. So, in my workflow, uh, if I have an idea, sometimes I'll come in here, just throw in the idea, hit hit generate, and just see what it does. Okay. Uh, other times I will go into my prompt generator. I've developed uh, an extension that allows me to interface directly with my chat GPT prompt generator. I have a couple different variants of it. Um, and I can generate my prompts directly from here. So again, this is part of my workflow. Uh, I can just copy and paste these over into the text image uh, uh, script for doing prompts from file or text box. I use this pretty extensively because I'm working with multiple prompts uh, at the same time, which is nice. Okay. Um, just throwing out, when I, when I have an idea, I want to throw out multiple versions of that idea. And so I'll throw my idea in here, like in this particular instance, I typed in abstract digital illustration of a dark swirling void filled with colorful nebulous clouds. Okay. Told it I wanted four prompts, 
add some labels to them so that I can identify the folder that it's in. Copy and paste this and into the uh, list of, uh, yeah, the list of prompts, prompt inputs. I can throw that in there. Hit generate, uh, set up a lot of other things, and it'll just throw out a bunch of them. I see something I like, I'll grab it. Okay, so that's just part of that workflow. So for those of you who are not super familiar with Automatic 11.11, um, this is the standard interface. You get your prompt, negative prompt, your styles menu over here. Uh, that one thing, one of the biggest additions to this was the ability to edit your styles directly within the interface. This was huge. Being able to come in here and uh, edit certain things like, uh, you know, I have a, and I don't know why it does this. The first time you select it in here, it exits out, so you have to go back in. So, uh, it, but this has been pretty big, adding a style in, uh, and the other part of it, and they'll talk about it up here, is the ability to add a prompt variable. This has been huge because uh, you can stack your styles, and it'll take whatever you put in your positive prompt and replace it inside of this, this uh, prompt variable. I'm enhancing or uh, amplifying this one, but... Um, which gives you a lot of flexibility when creating prompts, okay? So you can edit them directly in here. You add negative prompt, positive prompt, name it, save it, close it, okay? Then it shows up here, typically at the bottom. Now, this is all still part of the CSV file that is in the, uh, the Stable Diffusion Web UI folder. So you can go there and edit it directly inside the uh, CSV file if you want. If you edit it here, it will add it to the bottom. If you uh, refresh the web browser, you will lose what you just added in the list. It's still in the CSV file. And so in order to get that back, you need to reload, either reload the interface by closing it, the, the terminal, or going to settings. I think if you do reload UI, it uh, refreshes that, reloads that part, and you get your styles in the menu. Okay. So, uh, really cool addition. Down here we have just some of the basic settings, sampling steps, your width and height, okay, batch and uh, batch count, batch size. Some of you may not uh, are, are a little confused about the batch count and batch size. So think of it this way: a batch count is um, separate generations. So if you have a batch count of let's say five, okay of a batch size one, what that means is it's going to generate one image and do five separate generations of that. So, I mean, sorry, that, maybe that wasn't so very clear. It'll generate one image, but then it'll do that five times, okay? If you set a batch size of um, two, what that's going to do is generate two, two images at a time, but it's going to do that five separate times. Now, what you need to keep in mind with this, though, is that uh, your video card VRAM is going to dictate how many images you can generate at the same time. I have a 12 gig uh, VRAM card, um, so and I found that I can do up to four images at a time. And then you set your batch count. So if I did um, five batches of four images each, I'm going to end up with 20 images. Okay. This little button is. Uh, an extension called uh, Aspect Ratio Helper. It actually has a little accordion button down here, so you can do this. But I rarely go into the accordion button or accordion menu. I typically just use it right here. Um, if you want to install this extension, uh, there are some settings in order to get this button here. So again, the, the extension is called Aspect Ratio Helper. If you come over here, let me, uh, I'll show you the link and, uh, you know, just do a search for it. It's it's uh, very uh, it's very useful. I'll just say that. Um, let's see aspect ratio right there. Oops. So here's the GitHub link. Uh, this is a very useful one in settings. You're going to come down to um, aspect ratio helper, and uh, to get that button. In the menu, this uh, little selector button, which allows you to lock the aspect ratio and, or, or set specific aspect ratios, you want to go to, uh, again, the aspect ratio setting. You want to enable JavaScript aspect ratio controls. 
Okay, and you can set up your own custom aspect ratios. This is, this is really cool the way this is set up. Okay, and then you select the style of the JavaScript selection. So you can do an, uh, a drop down menu or options button. Okay, I do the uh, aspect ratio drop down, very useful, very convenient. That way it works great on my mobile uh, phone um, or on a tablet or, or else uh, other places. Um, you can hide the accordion. I don't. So um, you can set the UI component order. So anyway, just you can kind of play around, play around with it. Okay. So it's it's just nice being able to lock it, and then you can slide this wherever you want, and it keeps keeps it at a one to one, or you can set it to sixteen by. I do a lot of sixteen by nine. I love sixteen by nine. It works well when creating YouTube videos. Okay. Next, we have the high res and refiner uh, accordion buttons here. Now, this is part of the 1.6.0 update for automatic 11.11. These uh, don't have an enable button, okay? So by expanding these, it enables it, okay? So once you expand it, it turns it on. And at which point you start messing with your, set, uh, your settings, okay? Same with the refiner. Expand it, it's enabled. Select your refiner uh, SDXL model and start going at it. In this particular one, the switch at, think of this as a, as a percentage through the generation or the render that it's going to start using the refiner model. So uh, by default, it's a 0.8. That means 80% of, of the way through the generation, it's going to switch over to the refiner model. I I actually like putting it down to 0.7. It depends on what you're doing, okay? Config scale, just, uh, this has always been a, uh, one that's been hard for me to describe. I like to think of it as the higher the number, the more literal it's going to interpret your prompt. It gives the AI a little more creative freedom. As we're scaling it down, the AI is less creative, okay? Um, the seed option here, negative one just means it's going to generate a random seed for each image. The dice will, like if you have a seed in here, you put a seed in here, the die will, uh, let's just put one in, and then if you hit the die, it puts it back to negative one. This recycle button will take the seed from the image you have selected over here. Like let's say you generated a series of three images. You select one, so it's, you know, it's actually in focus. That image, if you hit this, it will grab the seed from that and place it in the seed, okay? If you like that image, maybe you want to generate more like it or whatever, or just regenerate it with uh, the refiner and high-res fixes, because that's sometimes what you do. You don't enable these. You generate a batch of images, find one you like, then you, you grab the seed, put it in here, and then you enable high-res fix and refiner and render that image with better quality and then before moving it and upscaling it, okay? A detailer is still a very useful extension. I've not really messed with, I think there's a couple others, I don't know what they are, that have come out recently that are made for uh, refining and detailing faces. This one's just simple to use. You open the accordion button, enable it, and there's other settings, but that's pretty much it. And what that'll do is it'll detect the faces in the image and render them so they look better. It fixes eyes, and and especially on smaller faces, AI typically has a lot of issues when um, there's a lot of faces, but they're small. They tend to be distorted. Okay, I'm not going to go into Tile Diffusion, Tile VAE. That deals with a different type of upscale. I have a different video on that and how to do that. I have already talked about the aspect ratio. Control Net is pretty extensive. That's going to require a whole nother video and um, a lot of the changes that they've made with this, uh, a lot of the models that they've added dealing with SDXL uh, version 2 and the uh, control net version 2.1 models. So um, I'll do another video on that updating uh, people on that aspect of it. Roop is still a fun one to use. Um, it's not supported anymore. I still like using it. There's another. There's a different one out there. I gotta see if they've got a, a usable extension for it. What this does is you can actually grab a picture of somebody's face and use that, and it'll it'll place that face 
in the images that you're generating. Let's say you generate a picture of a warrior, you want your face in there, so you drop your image here in the Roop extension and set it to generate that uh, after you've enabled it. And what it'll do is it'll actually pl place your face as in the style of what's in the image. It's pretty cool the way it works. Maybe I'll do a, a quick video on that later on. But again, there's another extension. I gotta see if I can find it uh, because this one's not being developed anymore, um, which is pretty sad. I, I think the other one is still based off the same underlying technology that the group uses, but it's being actively developed. Um, see, negative prompt white. This is not something that I, I think a lot of people have been using. I like using it. Uh, sometimes when you put your negative prompt in, it can be a little heavy handed. Um, so uh, what this gives you the ability is to kind of scale up how, how much your negative prompt takes effect on your images, okay? I will say this right now, I am finding myself more and more not even using a negative prompt uh, when using SDXL models. I find that the images it comes out with are, are very well organized or give me what I want. In fact, I find that I get what I want more often when I'm not using a negative prompt, especially if I'm trying to mix things like creating anthropomorphic animals, um, abstract ideas, uh, mixing different characters. You tend to, if you use a negative prompt, depending on what's in your negative prompt, it will um, negate a lot of those mixing effects, a lot of those uh, hybrid effects. So if you still want to use a negative prompt, uh, I would recommend getting negative prompt weight NPW, I think is uh, how they reference the extension. Um, Let's see if I can find it here. Yeah, so stable diffusion uh, NPW down here. Um, there's the GitHub link right there. Okay, oh, it's just called stable diffusion NPW. It's a good one to have if you still want to work with a, a negative prompt. It gives you a quick way of adjusting the weight of that negative prompt uh, using a slider. Okay, I'm not going to go into composable LoRa or latent couple. Again, that deals with the tile diffusion, tile VAE, and doing a uh, tiled upscale um, script. Uh, so there are these are all the basic scripts that come with um, stable diffusion. Really, the one I primarily use is the uh, prompts from file or text box, and primarily that's because I love using my prompt generator to generate multiple prompts to mess with. There are others. The XYZ plot is something I would get used to. Uh, this is a great one to use if you want to see how an image changes based on specific settings. Uh, there are other videos. I think I did a video on this a little while ago, maybe uh, if you want to look it up. So yeah, uh, that's the uh, primary interface. Image to image is uh, pretty straightforward when you generate an image here. Uh, you can send it over to image to image to do various things with control net, with uh, just rendering different variations of your image. Uh, we can, let's say we want to uh, just generate some images here and uh, get some variants and we'll send it over there. So give me just a second to do this. We're not going to use a negative prompt on this one because uh, I'm dealing with some abstract ideas. Uh, so we don't have to worry about the negative prompt weight. Now we are going to do this at 16 by 9. We're not going to generate that many images. I only want one per prompt. And yeah, we'll leave it at that. Hey, something I want to talk about while this is generating these images here is the model selector, the checkpoint selector up here. Um, a lot of people download a lot of models. I'm no exception. I got a ton of models that I work with and I've got to go through and organize these a little bit better. But one thing I've started doing here to help me identify uh, the SDXL models from all the others is putting them in a folder. So when you put them in the models folder, you can create a subfolder for based off, the, like say the, uh, the version of that checkpoint 1.5, 2.1, uh, SDXL. And when you put those models in there, it'll actually um, put the prefix of that folder name before the model name. So if you just want to see your SDXL models, oops, maybe it's because it was rendering. Let's try that again. Uh, 
you can just type in SDXL and it'll only show your SDXL models. Okay. I'm going to go through and actually reorganize all of my uh, models and checkpoints into their respective folders, whether it's 1.5, 2.1, or some other custom ones, so that I can identify them very quickly by just typing in something that I want to see here. Um, this works well if you're also looking for your in-painting models. Uh, you can just type in in-paint and suddenly there's all your in-painting models. Okay. Um, I love how you can just type it in, it'll filter it out really quick. Uh, give you quick access to it because sometimes it does get a little overwhelming when you have just a ton of models in here you're trying to figure out how to find one in particular so all right so we've got our images um, these are all pretty cool very abstract colorful but I really like this one here the mixture of the stars in the landscape we're actually going to send this over so in the 1.6.0 uh, version of stable or excuse me of automatic 11.11 they've gotten rid of buttons that have words on them and they've replaced them with these icons okay so uh, starting over on the left here this will open up the folder that the image is in so you click that it'll open up a Windows Explorer folder or just a, a file browser on whatever system you're using to the I think it's the output folder where the renders are going now you may have them uh, being filed into folders with the name of the render so for me that's one of the reasons I use these labels when I generate my prompts is uh, is a way of identifying that this next one here uh, will save the image to a dedicated image folder so let's say it's kind of like your favorites you select this it'll save it to an, in the there's an, a folder in the output folder called images this will save it into that folder okay so this one here will actually compress and archive the images in into a zip file um, I've never really used it maybe I should I don't know uh, this one here of the picture frame is for image to image the uh, palette is for in painting the um, angle here is for the extras tab and this one here is uh, it sends it to the canvas editor which uh, I think is I don't know if that's an extension or um, if that is now part of automatic 11.11 as a base install I'm not sure but we're gonna send this one over to image to image okay so we get this in here so with image to image you this you can change the prompt to get more specific effects um, I have noticed though that it does not send the prompt over I'm not entirely sure if this is I don't think this is my installation I correct me if I'm wrong if other people are having the same issue um, by sending this over typically before it would actually populate the prompt here you know what I think it is it's it's trying to populate from here on the text to image but because I'm using this here the uh, prompts from file or text box it's not doing so you may need to copy and paste the prompt over if you want to continue using that prompt so image to image is used for a lot of different things okay it is used to create variations of the image let's say you you know I like this image but I, I want to see something a little different okay um, so you can come down here let's say we want to generate uh, two more variations of this okay and we're going to come down here. I don't want it to change it a lot, so you're going to change the denoise strength. This will tell the AI how different you want the image to be from the original image. Anything below 0.4, you're going to get very close to the same image. There will be minor modifications, extra detail. That's used a lot when you're upscaling. Anything below 0.4, anything above 0.4, it's going to start changing the image. Especially if you go up above 0.7, you're going to get very different images. Uh, they'll look similar in the styling, but you're gonna, it's going to be different. So if I wanted to say uh, similar image, but uh, let's change some things up a little bit. 0.6 is a great way to do it. And um, you can change other settings, you know, sampling steps, which will help increase the speed. Uh, I usually don't mess with that a lot. You can change your uh, sampler. If you want to speed things up, Euler A is pretty quick. Uh, they've got a lot of new samplers out. Um, these are all the default ones that come with the new version of Automatic 11.11. 11. 
DPM++3 MSD Cross is one that I've used a bit. And uh, yeah, then uh, you, you know once you get those changes, you submit and it'll start re-rendering that image. And it, like I said, at 0.6 should be fairly similar. Okay. While that's rendering, let's go over some of the other things here in the uh, image to image. This is also where you would be doing things like your sketch, in painting, in paint sketch, in paint upload, and batch uh, uh, changes. Yeah, that's pretty cool. I like that. So most people are going to be switching between in paint or image to image and in painting. I've not used sketch really at all. Um, the in paint. Upload I have used when doing working with the InPaint Anything extension, and I'll do that in another video. I do have another video already on that, but we'll go through it again because there's probably been some updates. So image to image and InPainting are the two primary ones here that people will use to, let's say you finally get the image that looks great for the most part, but maybe there's something wrong. You can actually send this over to InPaint and start masking things out, rendering specific areas. Okay. Um, not much else. I mean, it's got all the same options as if you were doing the text image. Okay, a lot of people. This is where they're going to start messing with Control Net to uh, uh, make specific modifications to their image. I don't. I'm not going to go again. I'm not going to go into that here. So again, well, you have access to all the different, the same uh, extensions and options that you do have under the text image tab. Okay. Um, you can change sizes here. It will stretch and, and compress the image if you mess with this too much. Um, config scale. Uh, again, this is going to uh, tell the AI like how much freedom it has to be creative with the image. All right. So yeah, that's a pretty cool image. Um, let's move over to end painting. Let's just switch this over to end painting. So you can kind of see what this is about. So what this does, it gives you an interface where you can kind of paint over stuff. You have some tools up here. I know it's a little hard to see, but you have a little uh, drawing button, which allows you to change the size of your paintbrush, uh, a little eraser, uh, and you can and a back button so you can undo certain things. Like so let's say you get some skate and some of these in here. Oh, whoops! I don't want that one there. You can actually go back one, or you can just hit the erase and erase it all. Okay. So. Uh, Let's say you want to, you know, inpaint something. Let's say we want to get rid of this right here. I don't really like this glow over here. I don't know what's going on. Um, typically, what I'll do in my workflow is I'll come over here. I'll mask that out. When you're working with inpainting, it's all about context, giving the AI enough context to know what to fill it in with. Like if you're getting rid of something, maybe you want to just re-render that color as a city or something like that. But for right now, what I am going to do is just re-render that as a landscape. I just want to get rid of a, get rid of the landscape or get rid of the glow. Just add landscape. And so if I do it just like this, leave that mask there. What it's going to do, and if we do only masked, it's going to grab a square around that area, blow it up, and render that entire area using this prompt, which means it's probably going to add a lot of little details. It may add that glow. It'll take that glow and enhance it uh, based on the amount of change we want. So if you just want a general looking landscape, it's always good just to put a little dot over on the very far side. So it's creating this square all the way around the whole thing, but it's only going to render these two masked areas. But because it's like it's like drawing back the focus of the AI instead of focusing in directly on this mast area, okay? And so by doing that, and let's just increase the mass blur up to eight, okay? Uh, that way we don't get too much of a line effect. We are also going to select an in-paint model. Oops. Um, I don't want realistic. We're gonna do... Um, I like the uh, as of as of yeah RPG the RPG artist tools version three in painting uh, is always nice. I'll let that switch over. Let's just go down and check some of our other settings. We're in painting the mast area. We're using the original only mast. Um, we're gonna leave all the other settings the same. The width and height. Now you can leave it like this, and it'll 
the bounding box that will surround these two mass areas will be that same aspect ratio. Uh, I think that's fine. A lot of people will switch to a one-to-one. -one. I don't think it's necessary, but we are going to get rid of the, the batch size. Well, you can do the batch size if you want, give different variations of the masked area. Okay. So again, we're doing this little dot up here to create this area that it's going to pick, but it's only going to re-render these two small areas. But because you're pulling the focus of the AI back, it's not going to add a lot of detail. It's going to actually generalize it. And you'll see what I mean here in just a second. Okay. We don't need to mess with anything else. We're just going to render that out. And what it'll do is it'll create that bounding box. You'll see that it will shift its focus, but it's, it's going to be pulled back. And as you can see, it just re-rendered that landscape. Got rid of the glow. I like it. You can do that for a lot of different areas. Let's say you like that image. You're ready to move on. Send that over to InPaint. Okay. We'll get rid of this. Let's say we want to get rid of that glow too. Make sure you give enough area around it to give us some context to work with. This time we're going to move the uh, dot all the way over here to the other side. Re-render. Yep, there we go. And did a good job. Get a kind of a subtle landscape coloring change, which is cool. That kind of matches this one over here. Very cool. So that's end painting in a nutshell. Okay. Uh, if you'd like me to go into more detail on a new video, we can do that. I do have other videos that go more in depth in in painting and using image to image. Okay. All right. Extras. Uh, this is one where you're going to be doing upscaling. You're going to be doing, uh, depending on the extensions you have, removing a background. And I have a couple of extensions. I have the background removal tool. Uh, I also have a pixelization tool. Um, those extensions are very fun to have. Uh, let's see. So the ABG, nope, that's not it. Um, where are we here? I want to make sure I show you guys the, the, the Web UI REM BG. So Stable Diffusion, Web UI REM BG is the background removal tool I use. And this is actually a really nice one. It works great for uh, creating, I use it to create t-shirt designs, honestly, um, and, and creating transparencies, meaning it'll, it'll remove the background and create an alpha blend. Uh, so you can upload it to places like Redbubble for stickers, things like that. Um, and then the uh, pixelization uh, extension, let's see, where is that here? Yeah, right here. So Stable Diffusion Web UI Pixelization. This is a great extension as well. Uh, does a really good job of uh, pixelizing stuff. So let's say we want to take this image we just got done. Let's send it over to the extras tab. Uh, we're not going to upscale it. Um, that's part of this. You have the resize. You can determine how many times you want it to upscale it, and you pick your upscaler here. Okay. For the uh, pixelization, let's say we want to enable that. We're going to pick our pixel size. We're going to do pretty big, you know, nine on the pixel size. And that's it. We're just going to generate that. Should be pretty quick. And it'll pop out something that looks like a retro video game that's really pixelized. Let's say we want something a little less pixelized. Yeah, there you go. So, yeah, it does a pretty good job. It's a little soft. Let's see. Not sure why it's soft. Maybe, uh, I don't know. Could be again the pixel size and it could also be because i'm working with a smaller image uh, but instead of upscaling the image yeah that looks better so then the uh remove background is again something that i would use uh to change or to remove, back, remove backgrounds on something that i want to use say uh on on a website like redbubble so we're going to disable this uh, we're going to come up here and we're just going to do, I have a couple of styles and I'll, and I'll make these styles available later too. So we're going to do um, uh, epic uh, demon face. And we're going to come over here, t-shirt 
style design. And let's just see what that does. We'll do a couple. Oh, hold on. I want this to be four by five. All right, so let's render that out. Let's see if I get what I'm looking for here. Oh, oh, oh. You know, when working with Automatic 11.11, it's hard to, sometimes you forget that you're on an in-painting model. That's why it's giving you some weirdness there. So I'm going to switch back over to my favorite, the Sahastra Kotai model. This one works really well for this. There we go. <clears throat> so there we go. We're getting a pretty epic looking <laughs> demon face. <laughs> you want to put this on a t-shirt. You know. Pretty fun stuff. Um, I've, I've done a lot of different ones. Uh, ranging from cute stuff to pretty grungy stuff. Okay, so we ha it's going to give us two different designs here. So there's that one there. That's pretty cool. I like that one there. We're going to send that over to extras. And we're going to enable the uh, background removal. We're going to start with the U2 net. Depending on the image, sometimes it has a hard time removing aspects. I think this one's going to have, be pretty easy because it's got this nice bit of a white outline around it, which uh, sometimes it doesn't have. So we're going to do that. And we're going to do alpha matting. Okay. Now, this, this only works with PNGs. So make sure in your settings you have it set to PNG, okay? Uh, we're not doing pixelization. We're not gonna upscale it. We're just gonna test it to see if it's actually able to remove the background on this one. For those of you who stuck through the video, I appreciate it. I know I'm kind of blasting through a lot of this. Um, really kind of a uh, really good overview of workflow on some things. So, okay, so, when it shows the image, you're like, well, did it actually remove the background? You can kind of tell because it's blue, not black. And when you bring this up, if you scroll through, it's showing you the trans that it's trans it's created the transparency down here. You can see that there's still black here, okay, around the horns on the inside of the horn. Sometimes it does have a hard time when you get on the inside. It has to do with like how it's eroding away the background. So if you get something like that, we can try the next one, U2 Net P. Give it a second to pull that out, and we'll see if it does a better job of removing the background on that. Now well, it looks like it did about the same thing. And you can move through those until you find one that actually works. You can mess with the settings over here on the background and foreground thresholds. Uh, we're going to try the general use one. I've had some pretty good success with that. Some of them take a little longer than others. Uh, but because we're not upscaling, most of them are pretty quick. That one worked great. You can see it got rid of the black inside the horns. You can see right here it did kind of on the forehead too, but that's not going to matter when you put it on a sh uh, on a t-shirt, uh, especially a black t-shirt. Um, it's going to totally come out. You're not going to get this black framing at all. It's just going to be this cool head on a t-shirt or a sticker or whatever you put it on. So that one worked really well. So that's just kind of a cool thing you can do with the background removal tool. Okay. Um, PNG info. You can drop your image in here. Let's say you have a, an image you want to um, find the info on. This is a great way of doing it. If you uh, maybe grab an image from somebody's site, they shared it, and you have I uh, want to see what their generation info was. You can actually throw that in there. Let's just come over here and grab some weird stuff I was working on a little later. And uh, actually, let's see if I can, I don't know if I can send that directly to, yeah, no, I'm going to have to grab it out of the folder. Give me one second here. Okay, so let's go back over to the PNG info. We're gonna drag a couple different images so you can see what this does, okay? Um, this was just, I was feeling uh, I needed to see something weird. Man with licorice arms walking down a city street. But it also gives you the steps, the sampler that was used, config, so you, you can take all this and actually send it over to text to image, image to image, and painting, and extras.
Okay, so if you want to regenerate stuff. Um, this works for a lot of different, for, you know, if the image has it there, it will uh, put that information in there. So if it was uh, generated using um, AI sometimes or automatic 11.11, it'll have that in the metadata, okay? Uh, I, I already kind of went over this. I have another video on my, my extension. So the extension is free. I provide it up on GitHub. Um, it allows you to interface with ChatGPT. Um, all you do is put in here, like you can select new API key, put in the title, your API key, hit add, and it'll add it in. Come down here, you select your API. Um, you can have pre-made seed prompts that you can add up here as well, just adding a uh, title, your seed prompt, and uh, click add, it'll add it in here. And then you put in your message, and then you select your model, okay? Um, I'll switch between either the GPT 3.5 Turbo model or the GPT 3.5 Turbo 16K. Uh, the reason I would select the 16K is just due to context length. My seed prompts are pretty long. And so the normal 3.5 Turbo limits me to about four or five prompts. But by selecting the Turbo 16K, I have been able to get up to, I think, eight or nine. Let's try eight. To see what it does here. This may take a second to render this out. All right, there you go. As you can see, um, all the functions worked. It generated, let's see, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight prompts. Cool. I mean, it did include some things like the trending, even though I didn't have it selected over here. That's just the nature of uh, working with ChatGPT. Sometimes it includes it, and it's really difficult to lock that in with a precede prompt. So if I were to re-render this or regenerate this, maybe it would not include it next time. But if you do select these over here, it will include uh, like in the style of a random artist or whatever. Labels, you don't have to have labels if you don't want. You can actually save your responses to a CSV file uh, in the directory of the extension. I'm going to get this set up so that you'll have a button that you can click that'll open that up later on. So uh, I like saving my prompts every once in a while so I can go back to them if I find something. Uh, I create one that I really like. Okay. I've not messed with the Canvas editor a lot. Um, gives you options of uh, putting text and backgrounds and other things messing with your images. Depth library uh, something that allows you to work on fixing hands um, through the depth models. In Paint Anything is incredibly useful. I do have a uh, video on this. If, this is a very powerful tool allowing you to mask out or create a mask of an image and then masking things out to make adjustments. Um, if I were to drop in, let's say this right here, we're just going to show you the uh, what it'll do here real quick and how it works. So we got that in there. We're going to just hit, uh, I think it's run segment anything. And what that does, it has a specific model or a series of models that uh, are able to detect the various objects and patterns in the image and separate them through colored masks. Okay, just like that. And with this, you could go through and um, create a mask so let's say uh, we want to change maybe the type of coat this guy's wearing. So we're just going to mark this. You just need a little mark. You don't have to mask out the entire thing. Sometimes you want a bigger one. So you just put one there, okay? Create mask. And what this is going to do is it's going to take that area that's pink and create a mask around it. And then with that, you can actually send that over or do a, a prompt here. Um, you have your, your positive and negative prompt. And you can run the in-painting, and it'll regenerate that. Let's say we want him to have a white leather jacket. Oops. And then we have, let's say, we want let's expand the mask region just a little bit. It helps the AI with the context. And then we run in-painting. They've added some stuff to this, like the uh, iterations, which is cool, because it'll, I'm assuming that means it'll render that number of times to uh, to get different variations. And now we got a guy with a white leather jacket. So, anyway, it gives you the ability to really refine 
specific parts of the image. And actually, I would say this is better than using in painting because you can be very specific. Um, let's say we want to get rid of that mask and we want to change the ground. So we just mark that one area there. Let's create a mask. It'll create the mask on the ground. We're going to just say black tar. Say, uh, let's say black um, cobble stone. Not how you spell cobblestone. Now we'll just run the end paint on that. Should be pretty quick. Again, I've done a whole video on this. They have updated some stuff, so I may redo that video. So, and we got instead of uh, this concrete looking thing, we now have some cobblestone here. It didn't make it black, so that's something I would have to adjust through the prompting and whatever. There's a lot of options here. Um, I think maybe we'll do another video because they've done some updates. So I'll go through and make sure I'm up to date on that. We'll go through that later. Um, I've got two in paint anything tabs. I'm not sure why this other one's here. Oh, I might have a folder with nothing in it because uh, the way Automatic 11.11 puts the extensions in is based on the folder. So if there's two in painting folders, it might have, uh, it's putting a second one there. Image browser. Uh, this one here, I don't think is the one that's built into Stable Diffusion. I believe this is an extension that I use. Let's see here. Yeah, so it's this specific one right here. Stable Diffusion Web UI Images Browser. Gives you a lot more advanced functionality uh, for filtering, searching, uh, ranking the, the images, very cool extension, works really well. Okay, you know, that's it for now. I know I've, this is a pretty long video. I am, uh, if you've been listening to it this far, I appreciate that. Like and subscribe to my channel, uh, like and subscribe, or like the video, um, share it if you want. Uh, put some uh, comments in, uh, requests, things you'd like to see. Um, and uh, yeah, let's keep generating, uh, generating some awesome art, and we'll talk to you guys later.